Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, uh, Biju, are you in class? I just missed another point that I wanted to tell you about how to pray against witchcraft. Are you there? Can you just put a thumbs up if you're there, please? Okay, thank you. So I just missed one uh, point. Not Deepu. Okay, Biju. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Biju, your question you asked, uh, you know, how to pray against witchcraft. I missed a Im very important point that, you know, you have to declare the victory that Jesus has already won over every evil force. Okay. So you declare the victory of Jesus over every form of witchcraft, evil, and darkness, and that Jesus on the cross has triumphed over every power of the enemy by his death and by his resurrection, okay? And you stand on that victory and proclaim uh, uh, that victory over your life um, and, you know, declare that greater is he who is in you, in, in you than he who is in the uh, world and you know declare what Jesus has already won for you on the cross. On the cross, He is nullified, and every uh, principality and power has been nullified and disarmed. So that is something that you need to uh, uh, importantly, um, uh, you know, declare um, Jesus's victory uh, over the cross. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, we were looking at, um, uh, you know, chapter, we were studying chapter 8. We began studying chapter 8, Kingdom Government. And we, we said that God, you know, has authority structures that he has placed here on the earth. We saw the different authority structures that God has placed. And also we were going to see how, you know, uh, uh, we need to see God's authority structure being lived out uh, for mankind. Okay, so somebody can read First Corinthians chapter eleven, verse three. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Nevertheless, neither is man independent of woman, nor woman independent of man in the Lord, for as woman came from man. Even so, man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Amen. So, um, here we see that, you know, uh, in these verses, you know, um, uh, the authority structure is being described here. Okay, so there are three things that have been described here. The head of the woman is whom? Who is the head of the woman? Man. The head of the man is Christ. Christ. And the head of Christ is God, right? So now you and I, you know, know that Christ is... You and I need to know, uh, know that Christ is co-equal with God the... Father, God the Son, God the, uh, sorry, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are co-equal. There is no difference. But yet, we see here that the head of Christ is God, God the Father. So what do we mean by this? When already we know that each of them are co-equal, there is no difference. But when it comes to the release of God's government, God is saying that the head of Christ is God the Father. Why? Because Christ submitted himself to the Father's will and carried that out on the earth. Okay. So in the same regard or in the same manner or likewise, the head of the woman is man. Which means that man is not superior to woman. Okay. Because it says in verse 11 of that same chapter that... You know, uh, uh, so verse 12, woman came from man, even so man also comes through woman, but all things are from God. Okay, so he says that the woman came out of the man just as the man came out of the woman. So they are, they are not superior, they are independent to each other in the 
Lord. So in the Lord, we are co-equal. Okay? Because Paul writes and says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. But when it comes to God's government, the head of the woman is man. Are you able to understand? We are all co-equal, but when it comes to God's government, the head of the woman is man. The head of Christ is God the Father. And the head of um, um, the man is Christ. Okay? So that is God's governmental structure or order that he has placed. And we must learn to understand God's authority structure because when you relate correctly in it and towards it, we are all in God's authority government authority structure. So we need to learn to understand God's authority structure and when we relate in it correctly and when we relate to, towards it correctly, then we position ourselves to receive the blessings that God has intended for us through these governmental or authoritative structures or authority structures. So we look at each one of them. God's authority structure in the Family. Can somebody please read Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, please? Ephesians 5, 22 and 23. Wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the savior, uh, savior of the body. Okay, thank you. So here it says that, you know, um, God is saying, look, in the home, here is my authority structure that I am giving you. The head is the, who is the head of the home? The husband. And the wife has to walk in submission to the head, okay, or to the husband. And yet we know that husbands being the head does not mean that they are tiny monarchs in the house, right? Does not mean that. While they are the head, they also have responsibilities. Okay, look at what First Peter chapter three verse seven says. First Peter chapter three verse seven. Can somebody read that, please? Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Amen. So here he wants husbands to have this understanding towards their wife and give honor to their wives as weaker vessels. We usually give honor to whom? To people who are above us, right? But in God's kingdom, it works both ways. You know, those in authority learn to give honor to those who are also below them and also to those who are above them. So all of us in the kingdom of God have to give, you know, learn to give honor to those who are above us and also to those who are below us. Okay, so husbands have to, you know, honor their wives, even though they are uh, weaker vessels. Okay, and we know that both husbands and wives are co-equal. They are co-equal in the kingdom of God. They have equal access to every blessing of God, to every right. They have equal access to the word of God as well. But when it comes to God's governmental authority and structure in the family, the head is the husband and the wife has to walk in submission to the husband and the husband also learns to give honor to his wife okay then look at what about parents and children Ephesians 6 1 to 4 can somebody read Ephesians 6 1 to 4 please Ephesians 6 1 to 3 children obey your parents in the Lord for this is the right honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy 
long life on the earth. Amen. So, verse 4 says, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. So now, you know, the Bible is talking about the government authority for that God has placed for children. So children now here is a government authority for you. You know, what are the children supposed to do? Honor their parents, obey them. And when they honor their parents and obey them, that's God's government coming into your life. Now we all know, you know, uh, and it's a well-known fact, there will be a time when children will know a little more than their parents, right? Yes or no? Uh, some of the children who have graduated from college and got degree, they will know much about computer and gadgets and, uh, you know, media and everything compared to their parents. And they will also teach their parents, some of them, okay? But even in that situation, the Word of God says that we, even though as children, we know more, we have more information, we learn more, but we are yet to honor our parents. So honoring our parents, period, after that is a full stop. There's nothing more that you have can say or do. You have to honor your parents. You still have to give them regard, okay? You have to still esteem. Honor means you need to esteem them very highly. You need to treat them with respect and give them the reverence. You might know much more about the world, about information, about media, about everything else, about economics, politics, everything. You can know more than them, but yet you have to honor them and respect them. Why? Because that is God's government authority that he has placed in your house. And when you obey that, when you do that, it's God's government coming into your house. Okay. And when you do that, you're not only honoring your parents, but you're also um, you know, receiving God's kingdom into your life. You're saying, God, this is your government structure that you have placed in my life and I'm obeying you and God's kingdom comes into your life. You're receiving God's kingdom into your life, okay? The next one is God's authority structure for the local church, okay? Can somebody please read Acts chapter 20, verses 28 to 30, please? Can I read, sister? Yes, please. Yes, sister, get to. Thank you. Acts 20, uh, 28 and 30. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Amen. So here Paul is speaking to the elders at Ephesus and he says, hey, I want you to know this. I want you to watch over your own life. Okay. All of you elders and leaders, I want you to watch over your own life. Watch over the people that God has placed in the church. And why is he asking them to watch over the people that God has entrusted to them in the church because the Holy Spirit has made them overseers of their lives. So he's saying, hey, the Holy Spirit has made you elders and leaders and you are in that position uh, and hence you have to oversee the people that God has placed in your lives. And he says the other reason why we need to oversee people in our church is because these people have been purchased with the own precious blood of Jesus. Okay. So he's saying, don't treat them lightly. You got to be on guard. Why? Because these people are precious in God's sight. They're purchased by his own precious blood. Okay. Because all kind of things can happen to them. He's saying the savage wolves will come, take prey of God's people, meaning, you know, um, there will be people who come and speak wrong doctrines, you know, speaking perversive things to draw away the disciples, to take away people from the faith, people from the church. So saying, telling the elders and the leaders, that is why you have to watch over your sheep. That is why you have to watch over the congregation, the people that God has put you responsible over. God has put you responsible over these people. You have to watch it, watch over them, 
protect them, guard them, teach them, feed them. When you do, what are you doing? That's God's government coming into the local church. Okay. So, and in response, he says to people in the church, look at what he says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Can somebody read Hebrews 13, verse 17, please? Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Amen. Thank you, Lucy. So he's saying, hey, people in the church, listen. What do I want you to do? I want you to respect or treat with respect and be submissive to those who are in leadership or whom God has placed as leaders over you. Why should we, you be submissive to them? Why should you treat them with respect? Because they are watching out for you. They're looking after you. And so when we do that as people in the church, we are bringing, we're saying this is God's government coming into the local church. So when, when, uh, you know, uh, 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 when there are leaders and um, elders appointed in the church, it doesn't mean that those who are in leadership, they can do whatever they want. Okay. Uh, or because they are in that role of leadership and responsibility, they can do whatever they want. No. Look at what God's, you know, government still authority structure that he has placed for leaders. Can somebody read 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4, please? 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 4. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compul uh, compulsion, but willingly, not for uh, dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So what is he telling the elders here? That they must be shepherds of God's flock that is under their care, watching over them. Okay. Why? And also he says, not don't do it for dishonest gain, but do it eagerly, with enthusiasm, with zeal, not being as somebody who's lording over them, you know, not lording over those who have been entrusted to them, not being like a big boss, not directing them to do things, you know, or being authoritative over them, you know, but he's saying be an example to the flock. Okay. So some of these things that he's telling the elders, you no know, do's and don'ts. Okay. So don't do all of these things but be an example to the flock. That is what you're supposed to be, an example to the people of God. And when you do this, he says, when the chief shepherd appears, he will, you will receive a crown that does not fade away. Okay. And then in verse 5, he says, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourself to your elders, all of you, Clothe yourself with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud, proud but shows favor to the humble. So here he's talking about God's authoritative structure or God's authority structure. He says, hey, you younger people, what should you do? You need to submit yourself to the elders. Okay. And he's saying something more. All of you also be submitted to one another. So all of us are called to walk in humility, in oneness and in submission. Okay. And um, now, for example, you are an older person in the church, you know, um, and um, uh, as an older person in the church, you expect the younger people to come and, you know, put the chairs uh, to clean up, to set up and to serve and all of those things. So, you know, uh, you're telling them, Hey, all you young people come here, you know, one of you sweep, one of you, you know, clean, one of you put the chairs, one of you wipe the chairs. Well, it's okay. It's fine as an older person 
to ask them to do it. And I'm sure the young people, some of them will do it gladly. Some of them will be upset. Okay. But, you know, here it says, all of you submit to one another. So I don't think there's anything wrong if the older person also puts out the chairs with the younger person. The older person says, hey, come on, everyone. Quickly, let's all join together and put the chairs. And he's also putting the chairs with them. Or he's saying, hey, come on, everybody, let's clean up this room. And he's also taking the broom or she's also taking the broom and sweeping and wiping things. Okay, that is what scripture is asking us to do. Okay, scripture is saying that all of us, we need to submit to one another. All of us should walk in humility. Okay, that is what the Bible is teaching us. Okay, all of us to walk in humility towards one another and all of us need to be submitted to one another. So in God's government, in the local church, there's a pastor, he's responsible. There are people in spiritual authority, they're also responsible. And God's people are called to walk in submission and honor and reverence towards them. Yet, those in leadership, those who are in places of position, they should not abuse their position or authority Oh, and the Bible teaches us that all of us have to walk in humility towards one another. And when we, each one of us, do our part, then what happens? God's government comes into the local church. Are you able to understand? When God's government comes into the local church because we are following what he's asking us to do, then we can see the blessings in the church. So many of you ask, why can't the early church why can't our churches today be like the early church? I already said we don't use our kingdom authority that has been vested in our lives. The second thing is we are not following God's authority structure or God's government that is placed in the local church. There's no humility. There's no submission. Um, uh, the leaders are not, uh, you know, uh, submitting, being reverent, uh, you know, um, uh, being humble. Uh, the leaders are, uh, you know, uh, lording it over. They're not, uh, you know, taking care of the sheep. Uh, they're not setting an example. And the young people are also not following the pattern that is given in God's government authority structure. And that is why we don't see the blessings. Same way in the family. Why don't we see your blessings in the family? It's because the man is not being the head of the house. He's not taking the responsibility. Many house homes, it's the women who are being the, like the man in the house. The man is failing to do his responsibility. Or maybe in many homes, the woman is not submitting to the man. And also in many homes, the children are not being reverent and obedient to their Parents. And that is why we see strife and chaos and division and confusion in the family because God's government structure, authority structure is not being followed. When God's authority structure, God's government structure is not being followed, what is the result? We don't see God's blessing. Right? The same way when we don't obey God, when we sin, we don't receive blessing. The same way happens here. So see the importance of God's authority and government structure in these various areas of our lives. I hope you're seeing that. Yes? Yes or no? Okay. God has his government even in the body of Christ. Okay. Uh, look at what 1 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 28 says. Can somebody read that please? All of you with me? All of you are able to understand? Yes, okay. Uh, look at what uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says. God's the authority structure in the body of Christ. And, and God has appointed, appointed these, this in the God church. God has appointed these in the church. Go ahead, Deepu. Go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. And God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So he says, look, in the body of Christ, here is it. This is God's government. This is God's authority. There are the apostles. God has put them first, not because they are superior, but first in order, first in time, first in rank, 
of the government, not first because they are superior than others, but in terms of God's government in the body of Christ, he says that they are first, first in rank, first in time, first in order. Then he says there are prophets, there are teachers, there are workers of miracles, gifts of healing. Then there are those uh, who do helps and administrations. And he says that is God's government coming into the body of Christ. So what does the Bible teach us about this? The Bible teaches us that we need to give honor to those who are in positions of leadership, not because they are better than us, but at the end of the day, we are all co-equal. We are all equal together in the body of Christ, but we give them honor because of God's government authority structure that he has placed. And when we do that, you know, it brings his government structure his brings his blessings into our lives so for those of uh, who are in these positions or who are in these positions of authority that god has placed it's not for us to be you know proud about it and go around and say hey i'm apostle jones i'm prophet smith i'm uh, prophet selena it's not for that sake okay the fact is not that we should abuse it uh, you know, but why has God put that there? Why has God called us to be apostles, prophets, uh, pastors, and teachers? We've already studied that, right, in detail. Why? Because equipping of the saints for the work of ministry and edifying the body of Christ. So why has he put it there? He's put it there so that the uh, the body of Christ can be edified and can be equipped, okay? So... Those who are in leadership, they are not to be doing all the ministry. Who's supposed to do the ministry? In the kingdom of God, who's supposed to do the ministry? Believers. The people, the believers, the saints. Okay? And uh, these leaders whom God has placed, what are they supposed to do? They are supposed to edify and build and empower and strengthen the people to do the ministries, okay? Sometimes the pastor thinks that he is supposed to be the minister. The pastor is just an equipper. You and I are the ministers of God, the local people, the, the, the believers, the saints are those who are ministry, okay? Who are to, supposed to do the ministry, but it's a ministry of the pastor, apostle, prophet, teacher to equip the saints so that they can do the ministry, okay? So that is God's, authority structure in the local church all of you able to understand yes okay the next one is god's government also comes in the workplace you might be saying hey i didn't know that god's government comes in my workplace you know you might be teaching in a school you might be a uh, uh, you know, um, uh, marketing professional you might be a hr whatever you are god's government also comes in the workplace okay um now, many of us uh, in the workplace, you know, we work for organizations uh, where we have bosses over us, managers over us, people in authority over us, uh, or you yourself, you know, some of you yourself may be in places of authority, some of you in the online class, some of you in the e-learning classes, maybe places of authority yourself, you know. Um, and you have people reporting you, people reporting to you, people working under you. So uh, how does God's governmental structure come in the workplace? Okay, so let's look at some scripture. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 5 and 9. Can somebody read that please? Ephesians 6, 5 and 9. Tell it, sister. Yes, please. Thank you, Lucy. Born servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as man pleases, but as born servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you, masters, do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven and there is no partiality with him. Amen. Amen. So this is God's government coming into the workplace. We have the employees, 
So the Bible is saying, hey, now you listen, employees, you've got bosses. And here it doesn't categorize the bosses. Good boss, bad boss, medium boss. All of us have bosses. All of us have, you know, someone we, uh, a manager, someone we report to. You've got people you're working uh, uh, for. What must you do? Regardless of who they are, what they are, your responsibility is you as an employee of Christ that whatever you do, you do with all of your heart. You don't do it just to please them, but do it, you do it as unto the Lord. Now, if your boss is good to you, he's giving you good promotions, give you, he's given you a um, good high, uh, hike in your salary, you're very happy, you will work more diligently, committedly with enthusiasm. If he's not giving you any hike, not giving you any promotion, you will be so angry that you will not do any work. You will be grumbling and murmuring. What you can do, you will also not do. And what the Bible tells us, hey, that is not the right attitude. What should you do? Whatever kind of boss you have, you're an employee, you work with all of your heart, not doing things to please them when they are watching you, but do it as unto the Lord. All of you listening, do it as unto the Lord. And if you will relate like this to the structure, the authority structure in your workplace, what will happen? It says Christ, that God himself will bring the blessing into your life. God sees he will bless you. Remember like uh, Joseph? Joseph could have said, hey, I'm a rich man's son, man. I've never worked. I've never swept. I've never swabbed. I'm, you know, uh, unfairly treated. They've sold me as a slave. I can't do any work. I've never done all of this work before. And he can just stand, sit down there in a corner and sulk. But the Bible doesn't say, but I'm just looking and reading at it. God is not partial. But why did he cause Potiphar to look at Joseph of all the slaves that he had? Because Joseph was very diligent and committed and faithful to what was given to him in spite of the wrong situation that he was in, right? And what caused that to happen? He obeyed God's governmental authority structure that brought blessing into his life. He became the manager of the entire household of Potiphar. And because of Joseph, God blessed Potiphar's business. That is what can happen to you and I when we serve in spite of how our bosses are, how they treat us, whether we get the perks, promotions, we are diligent, sincere, faithful, committed. God is the one who gives us the increase, the honor. He will raise us up. When God opens the door, no man can shut it. Amen? Okay? Amen. So this is God himself will bring the blessing into your life. So those for those who are in authority... So though we have looked at employees, now we are going to look at employers, those who are masters, you know, you're in authority. So what does the Bible say? This is what you need to do. So God says, I want you to treat people with fairness. Don't threaten them. Treat them right. Why? Because you also have a master. And who is your master? The end of the day, you are also reporting to a master you have one above you who is your master and you know uh, he is a god who does not show any kind of partiality okay it's no partiality so you are answerable to him so each one of us even as we are managers even as we have people under us you know we need to know that people are not don't know our internal attitudes motives and agendas God is seeing and we are answerable to him. Okay. Now the last thing is about the civil government. Can you please put on one of these fans, please? The last one is, thank you, sir, is civil government. Okay. Now uh, we are living in two governments. As believers, each one of us are living in two governments. Which are the two governments we are living in or living under? Huh? <laughs> Central and state. Okay. Uh, the government of the kingdom of God and the government of, of the world, right? So we are part of the kingdom of God. So we directly come under the government of God. We are also in a world, in a nation that has a government. 
in a state that has a government. So there is a civil government. And so we must also learn to relate correctly to the civil government. Okay. Now look at what there's an incident in Matthew chapter 22 verses 18 to 22. So can somebody read that please? Matthew chapter 22 verses 18 to 22. But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore the, to Caesar's the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard this word, they marveled and let him and went their way. So here are the Pharisees. They wanted to, you know, they wanted to um, um, catch Jesus so that they can, or you know, set a trap so that they can condemn him uh, or hand him over to the authorities. So they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know, we know you are a true man. We know that, you know, uh, you would not say anything that is wrong. We also know that you're not afraid of anyone and you're not afraid of any man. So they ask him a question. They ask him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Okay. And Jesus knew that tricky question. Because if Jesus said yes, they would say, hey, you are a false Jew. How could you support the Roman government? Now, if Jesus said no, they would say, hey, you know, here is a man who is telling us or teaching us to revolt against the Roman government and they can hand him over to the Roman soldiers. Okay? So either way, Jesus was going to get caught and trapped. But Jesus, you know, uh, through the word of, uh, you know, um, discerning of spirits, word of wisdom, knowledge, he knows their intention. He says, bring me a coin. So bring him a coin. So he says, whose image is there on this coin? They said it's Caesar's. So what does Jesus say? We are all familiar with that familiar statement Jesus may, says. says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Very simple. Okay. This stuff has this image of Caesar. Give it to him. That means pay your taxes. And he says, you're made in the image of God. You belong to God. So give God your own self. So the main point we're getting across here is that we must respect even the civil government. Jesus taught us we must pay our taxes and do whatever the nation requires you to do. Okay, so Paul explains uh, regarding this to us in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through uh, 2 to 7. Can somebody please read Romans chapter 13, verses 2 to 7, please? Kofi, I see your hand up. After I'm done with this, I will ask you a question, okay? Romans yeah. 13, 2 to 7. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid or the of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience's sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to these very thing. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to who customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Amen. So he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. So the government that you are under is appointed by whom? By 
God. So we must look at governments, whether it's in our state government, whether it's in our central government, you know, as those appointed by God. So you can ask this question, what if they're abusive, right? What if they are wasting our money? So, you know, what if they're doing all kind of wrong things? You know, what if they make the wrong decisions? Well, that is not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to see the government has been appointed by God. And God in his own way who brought these governments into uh, power will be able to work through the government. Okay, so he's, he will be able to release his influence in and through our government. Now, verse 3 says, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. That means if you're fighting against the government, it says you're fighting against God. And those who resist the government will bring judgment upon themselves. Okay, look at what verse 4 is saying. Saying, and he's calling the government, he's, what is he calling the government in verse 4 as? What is he calling the government in verse 4 as? Come on, it's in your Bible. What is he calling the government in verse 4 as? God's ministers. Yes, he's calling them as God's ministers. Okay, so he says the right way to relate to them is to give respect, to give honor to those who are in governments. So you can say, but I don't like them. You know, they are not from my party. I did not vote for them. Well, none of that. All you need to do, the Bible says, you give honor, relate to them rightly, pay your taxes, give respect. You submit yourself to whatever rule and law. And when you rightly do that, you are receiving God's government into your own life. Okay. And God will honor you. I know you have a lot of questions. Hold your horses. I'll finish this and then you can ask your questions. Now you and I, like I said, we need to understand that we are under two governments. There may be situations and probably there will be situations when the government of the nations or the government of our land, the, gov the government of, that is, of man, contradicts the government of God. In those cases, we have full freedom to violate the government of man and submit to the government of God. Okay, look at what Acts the, uh, chapter 4 is an example where the government of God, you know, the Sanhedrin and the others, you know, they caught Peter and John and they said to them, we command you, you know, um, uh, not to preach and teach in Jesus' name. So that was the government of man. They are saying, we are commanding you not to preach and teach in the name of Jesus. But what? look at what Peter responds. Peter responds in verse 19. He says, you tell me what is right to do, whether we should obey God or we should obey man. So in a situation like this, in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, he says, listen, our obligation is in this situation is to follow the government of God. His government authority says that we are to go and preach the gospel to every creature, to every one. And he has commissioned us to do this. So in this situation, you know, we submit ourselves to the government of God. We have the freedom to violate the government of man. But in all other cases, we are to submit ourselves to the government that is in place, the civil government that God has put into place. I want us to understand something, that the kingdom of God is very different from the governments of this world. Um, you know, um, so any of you can, you know, one of you can ask, okay, what form of government is right? Is it democracy? Is democracy the right kind of government? Is monarchy the right kind of government? Or, you know, what should I follow? Democracy? Now, we can argue about these different systems, these different form of governments, but you and I must understand, first of all, that the kingdom of God is totally different. The kingdom of God is theocracy. It means God says it is done. Whatever God says, it is done. No questions asked. 
So we, in our democratic mindset, we want democracy into the kingdom of God. And so we say, God, can we vote on what you are saying? You said this, can we take a vote? No. But in God's kingdom, sorry, it is theocracy in God's kingdom. He says, you follow me and there are no votes. You do what I have asked you to do. So the kingdom of God is slightly different in our world. So regardless of the form of government we have, you know, whether it's democracy or any other form of government we have, I want us to understand a few things. The first thing is that God is able to work in spite of who is in authority. He's able to do it. He's able to get his plans accomplished and fulfilled whoever is in authority. I'm talking about the government of this world. Secondly, that we as a people in a nation under a government, we have responsibility to whatever extent our rights allow us or permit us to vote or to pray in, to bring in the right people in authority. That is our responsibility. Our responsibility is to pray that the right government comes. Our responsibility is to vote. Okay, that is our responsibility. And every nation receives the government it deserves. So what we have today is the government that we deserve. Either we prayed for it or we did not pray for it. Whether we vote for it or we did not vote for it, we got what we deserve. We have the fruit of our own efforts. So as people of God, we must invest our time, our effort, our prayer, and pray for whatever is right to happen in our nation and make sure that we pray into God, pray into bringing the right people in the, in the right place uh, as government authorities in our uh, situation or in our country. Okay. The Bible tells us this in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 2. It says, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. Okay. So we have the responsibility to bring the right people into our government. But regardless of who is in the government, God is able to bring his influence through them. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll take on your questions because we have very less time. Okay. Uh, to Kofi first. Yes, Kofi, your question. Yes, my, my question has to do with the answer Jesus gave in Matthew 22, verse 18 going. The, the answer was, but Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt me, you hypocrite? That was the question. That, that is the verse. So my question has to do with, if they had come to Jesus with a clear conscience, with a clean mind, is it not possible Jesus could have given a different answer? I, I hope my question is clear. Yes, yes, I got your question. So if they would have come with a clear conscience and they said, hey, Jesus, you know, we are uh, exploited under this Roman government. We are paying our taxes, but they don't do anything to help us. Uh, what should we do? Jesus, I think, would have answered the same thing. No, here he's saying, hey, this coin, the inscription, inscription is about Caesar. You pay your taxes, do your responsibility towards the government that, and the authority structure that God has placed. And God, you know, in his, uh, in his sovereignty, in his will, in his power, will do what concerns us as his people. Uh, and he will bring about the freedom. He will change the government or he will uh, do things uh, that will work. For example, uh, Pharaoh in Egypt, when the people, the Hebrew people were suffering under him, right? Uh, what did God do? In spite of his stubbornness, in spite of his rebellion, hard-heartedness, God went ahead, did all the miracles, and he, and eventually Pharaoh said, hey, all of you leave my uh, country, leave my place, right? So God did that for uh, him. God did that even through various other rulers that we see in the Bible. So we do our part, and God does his part, like I said, he will, you know, use, uh, regardless of who's in the government, he's able to bring his influence to them and he can change things and change the government as well. I hope that helped, Kofi. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes, your uh, question, uh, Akil, we're already out of time. 
uh, with an option of a corrupt and a less corrupt government as an option mm. and we have to vote for either of them mm. so when these things happen it's like you know sometimes we also have to take a stand because of the persecution and mm. the corruption mm. so on a christian ground like how is it that you uh, choose when not to take a stand and when to I really? think on a Christian ground. How do you choose uh, when we have to honor the people who's there in the government, like uh, yes. things? So how would how would you take a stand when you choose not to uh, uh, be so that's quiet? That's what I said. Uh. You pay your taxes, you or respect and honor the government, uh. but also you pray that God. You see these things change. You pray God's kingdom come, His will be done. Okay, and also God in His time will change the government. Yes. Okay, we'll stop here. I I posted uh, a note in um, a Christian, um, sorry, Christian, Christian history and missions. Uh, I said I'm going to give you the uh, assessment on um, Friday, right? Yeah. So are you all okay with it? Please respond to that. Okay. And uh, we missed two hours of. Uh, class time of kingdom of god um uh last week so is it okay if i record two hours and then you all can listen to it is that fine or is it too much is it fine what about the re what about all of you online students is it fine for you all so that we can complete our portions okay thank you warren shaker lucy deepu thank you yeah Yes, Kofi, you have a question? Oh, sorry, sister. Sorry. Okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a blessed uh, day. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sister.